yesterday was the yard site of Gary Glassberg, um, a deeply loved and truly decent human being in the world. And we asked Mimi if in his memory she would share a few words to help um, prepare us to say Yisker together today. Over the years, occasionally, I would imagine the moment when my life would change. More often than not, I would be standing in the shower where I would do my best thinking and I could see it with clarity. A diploma, a marriage, a baby, the stuff days are made of. More infrequently, I would imagine tragedy. I had grown up with some, so I had a minor frame of reference. But I knew I had a tendency towards the dramatic and I would shake it off knowing that I had a vivid imagination. But the idea of that moment when suddenly everything as you know it is no more, a moment when you feel your insides outside your body, when you are cut by a knife with such clarity that there is a before and an after, that idea never entirely left me. One year ago this week, my husband died. It was sudden. It was unexpected. It changed not just my life and the lives of my children, but the lives of many people, some of whom are in this room. In that moment, when my insides came out, I became an expert. I became an expert in putting one foot in front of the other. I became an expert in accepting food from people I barely knew. I became an expert in unopened mail, in missed days of school, school, in phone calls unreturned, and not coincidentally, in very late night television. I became an expert in grief, or at least I thought I was an expert. It should have been obvious, but when there is an empty spot in the bed where there wasn't, when the kids' morning pancakes suddenly aren't being made, when the dusty car is sitting untouched in the driveway, when you're checking widow on the school forms for a while, nothing is obvious. Eventually, I realized something. I'm not sure when. It may have been when the doorbell stopped ringing so frequently, when the kids started going back to school. It may have been when Patton Oswalt wrote that piece in the New York Times about finding his wife dead in their bed. And it may have been when I was offered Sheryl Sandberg's book for the 59th time. <laughs> some of them were comedians, and some of them, other people were experts too. Some of them had platforms like the internet, some of them were comedians, and some of them, many of them, most of them actually were just people, people like me. People to whom a tragedy had paid a visit, but who didn't have a public face, who didn't have a brand or the late night talk show circuit. People who had quietly, one day at a time, somehow kept on going. Or on some days barely kept on going, or just didn't. Grief, at least for me, is a confusing concept. It isn't that you don't want people offering solutions, holding out their hand, giving answers to a problem that seems impossible to solve. I want answers as much as the next person. I suppose we all do. But one of the many things I've learned about grief is that there are no answers. At least, there are no answers in the short term. And the short term may last a long time. And while some people manage their grief spectacularly well in public, others barely manage it at all. For all the grief groups and ideas of how to drag yourself out of bed in the morning, there is someone, maybe someone you know, maybe someone who is sitting next to you right now, who yesterday was on the couch in their pajamas, eating a pint of ice cream with unwashed hair and a TV that had been running for at least 24 hours. Grief. It's like having a camera permanently pointed at your face with an audience watching. I guess if you're an exhibitionist, it might be OK, but most of us aren't. Most of us revel in the comfortable anonymity of our private lives. Grief steals privacy. It steals many things, I guess, but privacy is one of them. One of you asked me if I could freeze time and do anything, what would it be? Well, of course, I said I'd have my husband back. But knowing that I can't, it is difficult to know how to answer that question. I think about where we were a year ago and where we are now, and the enormity of what has happened becomes unfathomable. What would I do? Climb a mountain? Stare at the ocean? Freeze myself in time and space six months ago? Find a moment when we were deliriously happy and keep us there? That thing they say about how when you die, your, laugh, your life flashes before your eyes? I don't know about that. But I do know that your life flashes before the eyes of the people you left behind. Those are the moments I think of. Snapshots of a life. The first time he kissed me, the first apartment we shared, the, first, the day he went down on one knee, my screams when I found him. They all blend together in a tapestry, seamless and chaotic. That's grief. What do I believe in now? That's a good question. 
It's hard to believe I will never talk to him again. Imagine that for one moment. Think of the person you love the most, and then imagine that the last thing you said to them was the last thing you will ever say. If I had the chance to say one more thing to him, what would I say? I would thank him for a lot of things. I would thank him for things too innumerable to mention, but mostly I would thank him for keeping me warm at night and for being kind. Warmth and kindness. A crinkly-eyed smile, it is easy to forget, but there is nothing better than that. Nothing, I promise you. My moment of clarity isn't more important than your moment. It's just different, and my grief is no more or no less true. So at the end of my life, the first chapter of my story will be the same as my last. I was in love. Not that I question that, no more than anyone questions a marriage of two decades. I know when I look at the ring I wear on my finger, it's a little loose and I worry that it will fall off when I wash my hands that, like that will wash the love away. I know it won't. I know that no matter what happens from this point on and no matter where we all go, I'll have had that kind of love in my life. That's something for me, for my children, that's something that will keep us going. So here's my last bit of expert advice from someone who never wanted to be an expert. In a strange way, whatever the circumstances, grief propels you to a destination. It may not be the destination you imagined, but it will be something. In our case, we are lucky. We're carried by love. Not everyone has that. I know it sounds strange to say it in the context of grief. We are lucky. But I think it's true. <laughs>